Hi, how's it going? This is Rez, and I'm calling with for YouTube back to do another read-along review for Tibet Night and Beguile, written by John Philip Bentoncourt, Book Three, Chapter Thirteen. A thunderstorm rolled across a fractured sky of clouds and stars. <clears throat> the electricity rumbled through the air like bright cannonballs bouncing from one side of the sky to the other. It was a cold night. The water from the sea turn, could turn the sky of a human uh, to ice with just one brush of a foamy kiss. Evie began to wake up from her attack. She blinked her eyes as they slowly opened in a dim and blurry room. She blinked her eyes as they slowly opened in a dim and blurry room as her eyes adjusted to the small amount of candlelight filtering into them. She tried to move back, but then saw that her wrist and ankles felt restrained. She looked over to her right waist, then her left, and although she still was having trouble seeing, she could easily make out the ropes. Hello, she whispered to herself as she began to scan the room. It was familiar, and as her brain started to adjust to being in the gloom of her faint she finally realized where she, she was, the bedroom of Lockwood Thicket. Hello, she said again, unsure how to, how she got, or sorry, how she got back to the cottage she and Sebastian once shared before he did, in fact, it, before he died. In fact, it was the place he died. The very place he she stabbed him in the heart with a stake. Then, with one more shout of her kidnapper to make themselves known, the bedroom door slowly creaked open and a shadowy figure stood in the doorway. Who are you? What do you want? The tied up Evie screamed. What am I doing here? She added. Slowly, the shadowy figure began to step into the candlelight room, revealing himself to be Sebastian Lord. Evie screamed at the man she believed dead. She had seen his body disappear to ash. When she staked him in the heart, she saw him gone. She saw his eyes go back and go vacant. She saw his entire life vanish. How are you alive? How can you be alive? She shouted at him as she tossed and turned to try and get away from her very undead husband. Evie, Evie, Evie. Shh. Calm down, my love. Calm down, he said, sitting at the foot of her bed as he patted her leg that became slightly exposed from under her skirt. How can you be alive, Sebastian? I killed you. I killed you, she screamed as her breathing became heavy in her chest, her heart pounding like a wild drum deep inside her. You've read too many of those novels that you love so much. He chuckled. Creatures like me cannot be killed with garlic or a cross. See, he said, revealing a golden necklace around his neck and under his shirt with a golden crucifix dangling there. But I staked you. I staked you, and you turned to dust before my eyes, she repeated. A temporary distraction while my body regenerated, he explained smugly. No, Evie told herself, holding her baby bump as if to protect it from its monstrous father. Evie, listen to me. Our old myths and legends... And besides, Eliza's spell is much stronger than old wise tales like that. It made it so only one thing could destroy me. Something no human could control. I'm dreaming. This is a dream. 
you're not really here. I'm asleep in my bed at Terramore, and you are just a fake man in my imagination, he said in a pant tone. No, 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 my love. You're not asleep. This is not a dream. This is real. I'm here. You are here. In our little home together, see Sebastian said, pinching you slightly on the fat of her arms to prove she was in real life. I killed you. You tried to kill Nicholas, and I killed you, Evie said again, her mind unable to process Sebastian standing in front of her in the flesh. Sebastian frowned. Remember what he had done to her brother, the attack, the bloodthirsty attack he had on her. It made him sad, realizing he allowed his dark side to take over. But it was what it was. He had to do what he had to do just because, it, like taking Evie in the middle of the night. Sebastian got up and faced the mirror just over a large black mahogany vanity in the corner of the room. And true to his word, the myths of the vampirism struck again. There standing in all his pale skin glory was his reflection. A f I feel terrible about that, Evie. I truly do, Sebastian said, turning back to his wife, tied to the bed. Just another roll of thunder rolled across the sky like a roaring mine. mine. But I had to do what I, and I'd do it again, he added. Evie's eyes narrowed as his callous words, saying he'd attempt to murder her brother Nicholas again if he had the chance, and I'd stab you again to protect him over and over again. I'd stab you, she said, her mouth spitting with anger at him. Sebastian's heart sank, and he rushed over to the bedside and got to, on his knees and kissed her softly on the arm, trying to comfort her. No, no, don't say that. You don't mean that. I know you don't mean that. You've gone through so much. Sorry, we've gone through so much together. That what you saw me do to Nicholas was just shocking. A shocking moment of my own weakness. He was trying to separate us, can't you see? I was trying to keep us together because we belong together. We've always have since we were children. We were betrothed with our fates. We were tied together forever. It's been our destiny to be man and wife, Sebastian said as the thunder once again rolled. Sebastian, you are not who I was supposed to be with. You become someone so different, something so different. You have no, you have no, she paused, no soul, she finished. I came to this place to fall in love, and I did. But all of that changed once you became this version of yourself, someone who wants to kill and take from others. That's not the Sebastian Lord I fell in love with. That's not true. I promise you it's not, he replied in a conflict with the truth. It is. Of course it is. Look what you've done. Look, look at me. Look at me, she said, forcing him to face what he has done to the woman he supposedly loves. This was the only way I could get you, Evie. You know that if I revealed myself to you, you would have come with me. You would not have come with me willingly. I had to be stealth and secretive with my actions and tomorrow night we'll go away together forever he replied sebastian you cannot do that you cannot take me she said causing him to remember the baby was his he got up on the bed slowly smiling sinisterly and put his head on her stomach listening to her heartbeat and felt as if he could also hear the babies too. He smiled and rubbed his hand on her belly, smiling the whole time. She feared him. He was so different, so cold, so dark, so monstrous that she couldn't even bear to look into his horrible eyes any longer. She turned from him and began to cough. 
She felt as if she were going to vomit and cough even more. Sebastian reached over and untied one arm so she could vomit onto the floor, and when she turned back, she swung at his face. He caught her arm and squeezed tightly. Tiss, 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 she said. I was hoping I could trust you, but I guess we'll still need more time for that. Yet yeah, as he tied her back to the bed, please, Sebastian, you have to let me go. This isn't what you really want to do. You can't live a life of nomads running around, he replied. That's not true. We can, and we will, he replied. But it's not what I want anymore. You're not what I want anymore, she replied, hinting about someone, something else. Her actual love in her heart and who it belonged to. He looked at her, his eyes narrowed, and his mind began to connect the dots. There's someone else, isn't there, he replied. Evie said nothing. She only stared at him, allowing the sound of a rolling storm over Lockwood Thicket to answer for her. Sebastian's eyes darkened, his skin suddenly turned a strange tone of white, whiter than it normally was. His blood, as cold as it flowed, turned to ice and he became enraged. He ravaged the tops of all the dressers and tables in the room, knocking the family pictures, vases, and plants to the floor. He ripped at the walls with his thick hands, tearing at the paintings and wallpaper, then with his iron fist blasting through a wall. He paused, catching his breath like a tiger after chasing its wild prey of an antelope, then ta losing it in the brush. His frustration and anger shone with every breath. Then, in a sudden jolt of movement, he fell to his knees and screamed a horrible scream in rage. The wolves in the forest that surround Lockwood Thicket heard his beaming scream and they howled. A terrible howl that made Evie's blood run as cold as Sebastian's. You deceiving bitch, he snarled. How can you have betrayed me this way? Who is he? Who? I haven't betrayed you, Sebastian. You have been the only one, she said. You forget Christian, he growled. No, he replied forcefully. Christian and I happened when I thought Mary had killed you. It wasn't betrayal, she reminded him. If the sun does not kill me, this news of a new love for you will. Sebastian said as his eyes went blank dark and cold. I should tear into your throat right now and end this once and for all. You don't deserve life the way you see it, he said in a monstrous voice that frightened Evie. You monster, how could you say something so vile, so disgusting to me, the woman you once loved uh, and the mother of you? She stopped herself before revealing her pregnancy. Sebastian stared at her. The what? Finish your thought. I'm carrying your baby, Sebastian, and me, and you and this baby's life, too. Remember that, she finally confessed. A child? Mine? You're having my child? Sebastian exclaimed with shock. Yes, a child you'll never know. I promise you that. I will never, ever allow this child near the monster you become, he replied angrily. You can try all you want, but once this baby is born, I will take it from you. You cannot be fit. To be its mother, not this way, not gallivanting around with, wait, the man that was here with Nicholas and Alice, Winterborn, woman, that man, him, it is him, Sebastian said, remembering the night of the battle where Nicholas, Alice, and Matthew were at Lockwood Thicket. If he said nothing, which to Sebastian said everything, ah, well, then I see, Sebastian said with a twinge of Stark. Why don't you don't see anything? You only want to believe you see or feel something. <coughs> because of the amount of paranoia running through your cold heart, 
I was talking about your, our child, not Matthew Winterborn. Evie said, exposing Matthew by name. Matthew, Sebastian repeated with a snake-like kiss in his voice. What a wonderful name. I should kill him from a view that you watch as I rip open his throat and drink his life force until it's drained from his eyes. One drop at a time. Would you like me to do that instead? You're disgusting. You see, how can I love you, a thing like you? You are not Sebastian. Not the one I loved once. Not the man I believed. I'd be with forever. Whatever Eliza did to you killed them, the man I loved, and birthed the stranger in front of me now. I wish I had never come here, Sebastian Lord. I wish with every fiber of my being I never married you, Evie said with tears streaming down her face. Those are the words of a woman whose heart is breaking. I promise you, this isn't what I wanted, not in the slightest. But you'll forget him, this Matthew Winterborn. You'll forget he ever existed, that I can promise you. The vampire said with a thunderbolt blasted over his head, carried with the autumn storm brewing in the sky. Don't hurt me, he said once again, trying to lift her arm up to the grab Sebastian, forgetting she was tied to the bed. Sebastian lifted up a brow. His heart wasn't in it to kill someone else again. Even if he were the man his wife had fallen in love with, despite the child in her womb, he wanted to end this obsession she had with Matthew. Or whatever it was, but to Sebastian, the more pressing problem at hand was getting Evie out of Walshport and fast. Once we're gone, once we're free of the secrets and the prying eyes of my family, Matthew will... It just is a little memory, sad, a sad little memory of your past. You will forget we'll be together forever with our little baby. It'll be a dream come true, Evangeline. A dream come true, Sebastian said, showing her his teeth. I won't go. I will not go, she said forcefully. Sebastian got up from her bed and smiled, a crude wicked smile, happy to see she was still as feisty as he remembered, but her fight was pointless as he saw himself as even more powerful than she could ever even think of. You will, my love, and let me start, you will and you'll be happy with me. Our baby will be happy too, I promise you. This, your life, is about to change, and for the better, tomorrow night after my energy returns. We'll be gone forever, Sebastian said, leaning down and kissing his wife on the lips, who tried to pull away. He adjusted his, his shirt that had become disheveled in his outburst and left the room to the rest of the dark, quiet side room inside the cottage, leaving Evie alone in the candlelight with her thoughts. As she wondered how in the world she would get out of this, she recalled what Sebastian had said to her when he first made himself known that the stocking could, the staking could, did not kill him, neither would garlic or a cross. All those things that even Sebastian pointed out were figments of fiction, all pretend ways to kill a vampire that even Eliza's spell protected him from all but one thing, the sun. Evie knew, knew that only sunlight could kill her monster of an undead husband. Only the sun and the light it shined could burn him away to ashes. Once and for all, of his cursed existence in her life. She needed to be free and bring hit this creature into the light to save herself and the baby. Light, bright, and warm, the signal of a new day, the giver of life, was Evie Jordan's one and only hope of survival. The storm 
above the island of Welshport continued through the night and into the morning. The flashes of lightning lit up the windows and blasts of light that came as quick as the snap of a finger. Rebecca Lord walked the red carpeted halls of her family mansion, a nervous wreck. She had not seen her May Georgina in almost two days. Her room was not used in that time, and now her granddaughter-in-law, Evie, was missing too. Evie did not come down for breakfast. Evie did not even send notice with a servant to the breakfast table that she wasn't coming to join then. She was missing too. Two missing women. Two women missing, sorry, from the same house within hours of each other. The storm of its electricity currents rushing through the air had also brought with it a small mystery of two vanishes within the walls of Terramore. In the pocket of her long purple skirt with twirls of black dahlias, Rebecca clutched her rosary beads and prayed in her mind a silent prayer. In hopes Georgina and Evie were both safe wherever they were. Then she entered baby Fabian's nursery where she found Charlotte and new mother Celeste fawning over the new ba Lord baby. Evie is nowhere to be found, Georgina too. I can't believe they'd leave the house without telling us, especially Georgina. She has a job to do here. And well, Evie knows better than to dismiss herself from morning breakfast without a word. Rebecca said, coming over to see the baby sleeping in his crib, oblivious to the wild storm he was born in. Celeste and Charlotte shot looks at each other again as they knew Georgina had transformed back into Mary and was hiding by them in the turret room. The two cohorts knew that Rebecca would stop at nothing until she figured out where Georgina had gone. Something had to be done, so Charlotte spoke up. I think she's gone for good, Charlotte said. Who, Rebecca asked. Miss Georgina. I think she's gone for good, Charlotte repeated in a meek voice. What are you talking about? How is she gone for good, Rebecca wondered. I saw her leave. Just leave last night before the baby was born. With everything that happened that last night, I forgot to tell you. I forgot everything she had. A bag with her. She's gone, Charlotte said as Celeste watched for Becca's reaction, hoping she'd believe her. But gone? Why? Why would she just leave without saying anything, Rebecca asked ironically. And Evie, where is Evie with? Was Evie with her, the matriarch added? Evie isn't here, Celeste asked. No, Rebecca had already mentioned Evie was gone too, but she was trying to draw attention from Georgina's vanishing. Rebecca looked over at Celeste and tilted her head confused. She was starting to feel as if the two were purposely stalling time, attempting to muddle what was happening. It was clear by their body language they, that they were both nervous and had something to hide. What's going on here? The two of you, what is it? What do you have to tell me, Rebecca asked. Celeste looked over at a 10-year-old Charlie who knew who now f felt her head covering for the transform Mary had and started to stammer a clear sign of lying. Slush jumped in to save the drowning girl. You know what it is. None of us have had any sleep. I surely haven't with our little boy now in the world. I think we're just all in love with him to make sense of why those two ladies would vanish from the house without a word. I can tell you that in private conversations that I also had with Georgina that she was planning on leaving. She wanted to go back home to be with her family. I apologize too with the fall and the baby being born early. I plumb forgot to speak of any conversation with Miss Kent. This is what Charlotte is referring to. She was there when Georgina was telling me this, as for Evie, I don't really know where she is. It's customary for her to take 
walks into the village in the morning air. I've done it with her many times. Perhaps she left earlier and didn't want to disturb us from sleep. Rebecca lifted a brow. Those were all plausible answers to this morning's mystery of the missing maid and the missing heiress, but still something seemed off. Rebecca was very keen on s smoking out the truth from people when she needed to, but she truly didn't have the energy on, on this morning, especially when she felt there was something much more twisted at fault for this. The plausible of Celeste's explanation was fine, for a normal world, but not for this world. Hmm, Rebecca replied in a frown. Well, then I wish Georgina luck wherever she is, and as for Evie, I have to talk to her about leaving in such a way. Charlotte sighed in relief. Char Celeste smiled nervously as they seemed out of the woods with their lives, but Rebecca, after kissing her new grandson and playing with some sort of Sure, while excused herself to household duties. This also means you need to clean up your room, young lady, Rebecca reminded Charlotte, just before leaving the two alone with the t baby. Do you think she believed us, Charlotte asked Celeste, who watched the door. Celeste shrugged. We'll see, she said, while her mind thought about when in the world what in the world happened to Evie? Rushing down the long staircase, Rebecca continued to clutch her rosary beads in her dress pocket as she flowed past a group of large checkerboard grilled windows in the foyer. She ran into Nicholas Jordan, Evie's brother. Nicholas, have you seen your sister? She asked him. He looked at her with glaring eyes. What do you mean? No, I assume she was out this morning, he answered. She hasn't been seen since the baby was born last night, Rebecca. But what? Are you sure? Nick asked, his voice filled with anxiety. No one has seen her. Her room seems untouched. As I passed it this morning on my way to Fabian's nursery, Rebecca said, well, there has to be a good explanation. She wouldn't just leave the house without telling us, would she? Nick wondered out loud. But as if he had answered his own question, no, she wouldn't. I'll check the village. I have an idea of where she might have gone, he added. Have you? Where? Rebecca asked suspiciously of this information Nick was privy to, and she wasn't. A friend's house, Nick said, still relying on relaying the information as vague as possible to keep Evie's private relationship still private. Rebecca lifted a brow up as Nicholas rushed out into the storm to find his sister. She felt an e uneasy about it all to the point where there was a knot in her stomach. She then turned to see the open door of the dining room and peeked in and where saw so found a housemaid and her assistant and driver Hampstead inside at a long table polishing silver. Hampstead, Rebecca said the open door. A word, please. Hampstead got up from the silver and walked in, into the foyer where Rebecca was waiting. Ma'am, there are a couple of members of the household missing this morning. I don't feel very confident in the explanations on their absence, she told Hampstead. Are they in danger? Hampstead asked. Possibly, with everything that has happened in the last few weeks, I don't have the confidence in everything at this point. And Eliza Good still runs this world. Reigns has been quiet, silent on what he's done to her. And I do not date seek her out myself, Rebecca said. Do you think Eliza is responsible for these absent members of your household, Hampstead asked. The witch has her claws and everything. Knowing her, she's killed Reigns or something. I mean, he hasn't replied to any of my messages about what he's done to her.
And I wonder if she's even been taken into custody and punished like I thought he would. Now I wonder what in the world she'd do with Evie and Georgina. Should she be responsible? She could use them somehow, some way to get to me. I know she would, especially if she found out I was the one who told Reigns about her. Rebecca told him, said who was starting to see his boss as a bit paranoid in her business with Eliza. <clears throat> Ma'am, I'm sure Constable Reigns has taken the appropriate responsible legal to Eliza Good. She will not be in any kind of trouble. For any more, Hampstead said, attempting to cool Rebecca's paranoia. No, Aaron, no, Rebecca said, using Hampstead's for a thing. I can't trust that. <clears throat> I can't trust that one bit. Eliza is dangerous and vicious sorceress. She'll have us killed. She started with Sebastian. She started with Sebastian. What would she do to Georgina? Or my God, even Evie, Rebecca replied as Hampstead saw her failing further into her strange paranoia. What would you like to do then, ma'am? He asked. Then as Rebecca thought and fiddled with her rosary beads, she remembered the man she met weeks and weeks ago at Hope Hospital when Jacob was admitted after his attempted murder. She remembered the man said to call him when she needed her help that she was would soon need help caspian was his name and he lived in the village and was a man of great psychic powers take me to the village i need to speak with someone someone who will no doubt help me rebecca said as the storm raged on over head in the roll of thunder and rain Yes, ma'am, Hampstead said. Rebecca went to a small side closet in the corner of the foyer and grabbed a thick coat, a black bonnet, and an umbrella. She tied to the bonnet tightly round her head and tucked the white and red curls of her hair neatly under the bonnet, then peeked back into the dining room door. I'll be out this afternoon. Please be of assistance to Charlotte and Baby and check on Charlotte's room. It could be clean. Rebecca instructed the maid, polishing silver, who got up from the table, curtsied to Rebecca and nodded her head that she'd do as she'd asked. Then Rebecca went to the front door of the tower and saw the ring pouring down into the wall or onto the well for frosted grounds of the mansion. She hoped and she hopped into the car. The Hampstead had pulled around and they together went off to find Caspian for answers. Nicholas arrived at Alice's front door soaking wet as the storm above finally let the rain fall and what seemed like gushes of water every five minutes. It was a strong tempest that caused the cobblestone streets to slightly flood with the mush of mud and wet clumps of the fallen autumn leaves in every corner. He knocked frantically on Alice's door, hoping Evie was there. When Alice opened it, it was almost as if she already knew what had happened, and in a way she did know she dreamt the night before he had told had told her that something ha happened to Evie. She grabbed Nick and held him close, his clothes wet, cooling her warm body. How long has she been gone? She asked of Evie. We don't know, he replied, as he warmed by the fire. Rebecca thinks just overnight. I went to bed early, and I didn't really catch up with her, so I really don't know, Alice. I'm worried about her. I was hoping when I got here, she'd be here with you and Matthew. Where could she be? Can you feel her energy? Can you feel her, Nick begged. 
What's this? Matthew said, entering the small home he shared with his sister. Matthew, you're home, Alice asked, surprised. The fleet was sent home. We can't go to sea today. The storm is too wild out, of, out on the ocean. Every liner in the area has been docked. What's going on, Matthew? Informed scene in the panic in uh, Nick's face. It's Evie, he said. Evie, is she okay? What happened? Nick, Matthew asked in a rush. They don't know where she is. Nick thought she'd be here, but now Alice confirmed. I think that I can find her, but it's going to take us going to a place where we will finally get the answers. I've been searching for all along. It won't be pleasant, but I know it will finally get us the answers, Alice said. What do you mean, the answer is, is there more? Have you been having your dreams again? Nick asked, remembering Alice's heart. Ponderly visions of Sebastian. Matthew and Alice shot each other looks, unsure of how to broach the topic of Alice's visions and dreams. He knew that it would terrify Nick if he knew the details. But if the storm in the air was any sign of what was to come, the truth would come down like the rain. Nick, there is only one way we can make sure what I am telling, what, or sorry, what I am feeling. What I am dreaming, what I am sensing, it's real or not, Alice said. Before turning to Matthew, we have to take him there. We have to go now, she said, grabbing her brother's hand. I don't know, Matthew answered. As Nick began to feel his stomach flip in knots, where, Nick exclaimed, go where, to Evie? What are you talking about? Alice and Matthew said nothing. She only handed Nick his coat and grabbed her own. Come, she said. The three, the threesome got into Matthew's small car he had purchased two years before. It was tiny and puttered around the village loudly, but he was proud of it. It often flooded in large rainstorms, but it on this day, despite the wild storm ravaging across the sky over the island, the car seemed to run fine. No stops, no flooding. They drove and drove over the small streets that took them to a larger road that led out of the village and got into the forest and through the thick, lush wilderness. Nick turned and looked back through the back window that was covered in giant drops of rain, conflicting the village that was getting smaller and smaller in the background. <clears throat> Where are we going? Why won't you tell me, he asked. In time, Alice said as she made eye contact with Matthew in the rear view mirror, both keeping quiet throughout the drive. Out of town, Nick felt his stomach tighten with nerves as various scenarios of where in the world he was being taken flooded in his mind. The three continued on their quick journey on the rugged roads in the skirt, outskirts of the village, the green hills and slopes of the island was even more emerald toned than a small stone this early fall. None of the wild grass had turned yellow and orange just yet. Everything still as green as summer. Then the small car carrying Alice, Matthew, and Nicholas arrived. A giant rock formation just off the western side of the island known as the West Ridge Woods. The cliff of the West Ridge Woods seemed to float all the way up to the heavens and dropped down all the way down the cold Atlantic 
Sea below, the rain fell hard now. The water, the waves crashed loudly. And Alice Matthew lead Nicholas up a small muddy path through a green pasture near the rocky cliffside. They continued this small hike up the cliffside and then down a path that turned almost in the shape of a sickle and to the open of a cave. Where are we? Nick asked. Come, Alice said as she grabbed his hand and went with Matthew and Alice into the cave. Matthew grabbed at the wall and found an old torch he knew would be there. He's been here before, so had Alice. This cave was not something of a mystery to them. It was a place that had known they had known all their lives. They had been here as children, as teenagers, as young adults. It was a place of worship for them. It was a place of solace and hope. This was the catacombs of their people, the Deanines. They were buried here, all of them, as the group made their way through the dark tunnels and the caves of the West Ridge Woods, quietly listening to a drop of water drip down the jagged edge of the cave walls they entered a large chamber in the center that had an opening at the top where natural light and rain fell through the three stood together and nick looked up at the wall that had carvings and paintings all made by the people that had lived here for generations and had been killed had been killed settlers from england whalers and scotland that took their land as their own the drawing work of their people the land they loved and the stories passed down generation to generation some drawings explain what the place in the cave was who the people buried there were and what had happened to them <clears throat> in the whales, large carved out shells that had ancient sarcophagi, some made of stone that had been dragged to this place generations ago. Others sarcophagi were made of wood. They were more recent burials, at least 75 years old. And others, even more recent, made were crested of, iron, crested of iron, crafted by the very hands of the person buried inside. Nick looked around. He counted and counted and stopped at 64 sarcophagi before it felt the dizzying of his eyes. There were just two men in the count. The cool air felt like it was getting colder. The longer they stood there and Nick felt a kiss of just over the back of his neck as he started at the thousands of old coffins lined up in the circular cave. I need you to believe what you're about to see, Alice asked Nick as she grabbed hold of both his hands. What am I about to see, he asked, shaking in the cold. The truth, Matthew answered, all truth. Alice took both of Nick's hands and placed them in Matthew's hands. Matthew squeezed Nick's hand tightly and winked at him, trying to comfort the nerves, Nick. Then Alice went over to the center of the chamber where the light trickled in from the surface with the rain. She stood there and allowed the water to pour down on her with the little light from the sky that could peek in. She lifted her hand and began to, to hum a song Nick had never heard. Matthew then started to hum too. They were humming the same song and tune in the, from the depths of their uh, sorry then Alice began to levitate. Her eyes began to glow. Her hair began to sway in the air back and forth like the storm in the air was pulling at her dark tress, 
trousers. Let it be known, literature show us, dear ancestors, who shall we fear? Who shall we trust, and what are we to know? Alice screamed her voice, echoing in the chamber, where all the ancestors were buried. Suddenly, in the reflection of Nick's eyes, they were open as wide as they could be. Bright bulbs of light began to come out from the stone walls of the catacombs. They were formed in the shapes of people, twenty people, thirty, then a hundred, then two hundred. More and more of the ghostly ancestors of the Dedenian people began to appear on the rocky walls. There were thousands of them, all now humming the same song. Alice and Matthew were humming. All the center of the group of the ancestors once stood out. Once stood out, he was large, framed, had no face but long hair, the globe blew with his phantom-like body as he stood up with his forward and the humming from the spirit stood in silence, only allowing the rain to make its pillar, pitter patter on the rocks from above. Who is that? Nick whispered as Matthew shushed him speak speak not of the name you fear the ghost as anyone listened he is craving and vow and wishes to harm all who are attempting to stop him oh great ancestor is this man I fear Alice entered she continued to float in the air facing a great man who was speaking the rain continued to come down. The thunder once again blasted across the sky on the great ancestor spoke the name. Sebastian Lord. Nick almost fell to the floor hearing the name of the man he thought was dead, his brother-in-law. Who has Evangeline at? Alice asked Sebastian Lord. The ancestor spoke. Then in the thousands of ancestors, blue glowing light repeated, Sebastian Lord. Who shall I fear my life from, Alice asked. Sebastian Lord, the ancestors said again. The other ghost ancestors repeated the name, Sebastian Lord. Dear ancestors, Alice began to say, Thank you for all you have done. All of you rest now again in your rocky keep. The shock was written all over Nick's face. Alice floated back to the ground and showed her regular form once again. Matthew handed Nick over to Alice again and she hugged him. He was trembling, shaking. It's him, Alice said, confirming the truth. Sebastian was alive and her dreams were warning her. He was Evie. Lockwood, take him to the thicket, Nick said as Matthew and Alice both agreed that that is where the monster had trapped Evie trapped. It had to be True, they gathered themselves and quickly made their way back through the caves away to the awaiting car. As evening approached and the storm over her head continued on its busty journey, the atmosphere slushed pat paced back and forth, dressed in a dark robe with ivory colored dash tied neatly at her waist in a bow, she cradled her crying baby in the nursery, hoping to the thunder would stop as soon as they could both get some sleep. While she did this, someone was picking the lock on the back door, slowly and methodically. The person jiggled the lock with two pines clicking and pushing until finally the latch lifted the door, popped open all on its own. The person pushed the door open and stepped into the mansion. Terrible was quiet. Rebecca and Nick were out. Evie and Georgina were missing, but the person entering the quiet mansion had no need for them. As this person slowly made their way into the house and through the first floor parlor and into the long hallway with golden frame, portraits along and long night tables made of black marble, they passed a framed mirror 
that reflected the face of the body of Philip Braga. He has snuck into the mansion to beg Celeste one last time to go back with him and leave the Lord's once and for all. He was terrified for her. He wanted to save her and keep her safe from harm, her and the baby. Philip continued on his path into the mansion, when suddenly, as he started up the same staircase, Celeste was pushed down. Something came down on the back of Philip's head on a large blow, knocking him to the floor. Philip fell backwards and knocked his head on the marble floor at the bottom of the staircase. Philip's eyes opened. They were blurry, but he could see the dark cathedral-like ceiling over his head. His head was throbbing with pain from the blow to his head. Still lying on the ground with the blurred vision, he reached to where the pain was coming from around the back of the head, and then his hand returned to the fogginess of his vision. He could clearly see blood. Then a face appeared standing over Philip. It was Jacob Ward. I should call Reigns right now and have you arrested for breaking and entering, but I feel like I owe you something for that mangled hand of yours, Jacob said, referring to Philip's damaged hand from the accent he and Jacob with Jacob all those years ago. My head, Philip moaned. Get the hell up, Jacob growled. Where's Celeste? Where is she? Philip asked, stumbling to his feet and steadying himself on the banister of the staircase. Jacob smirked evilly. Ah, so you're here to win her back, is that it? Well, friend, that will prove to be futile, because Celeste has just given birth to my son, our son, hers and mine, and she's agreed to be my wife. You're lying, you're lying, Philip shouted. No, friend, it's all true, Jacob said with a snake like his voice, while the rain poured down outside she would never marry you she hates you she's always hated you she would never marry you jacob she loves me and she's to marry me i will marry her philip said as the trail of blood continued to come from behind his head ear down his neck stained the color of his shirt i feel you are now mistaken and it's a shame you had to discover it this way but it's true she and i we made love, we became one, me, her, and our bodies joining together in my bed, all warm and wet inside, and as Jacob began to embellish his time with Celeste to purposely taunt Philip, Philip groaned in emotional agony and leapt from the edge of the staircase and lunged at Jacob out, grabbed hold of him. They both fell to the floor and began fighting, one punch to the face, one punch to the ribs, Jacob was stronger than he looked. After his shooting and Philip was one hit with was one hand. They fought only for seconds, but it felt to them like hour finally Jacob landed a punch hard to Philip's face, knocking him out and without even thinking, Jacob dragged man's unconscious body up the long staircase and through the halls. Past the various gloomy faces of the family members and the painted portraits finally arriving on the floor, third floor landing just in front of the turret room door, Jacob turned and locked the door and dragged Philip in, leaving him just behind the door and then vanishing, leaving Philip there in the dark to rot alone. Or so Jacob thought. Hours passed and finally Philip came to, but not in a dark room with a turret like Jacob found it, but in a candlelit room where Mary was in hiding. She was weak and cold and hadn't eaten in days thanks to Celeste and Charlotte being busy with the new baby. She stared at Philip from her small makeshift bed as Philip rubbed his eyes. Mary, he shook. Sure he said in shock. They said they said you were gone, dead. Has Jacob had you here the whole time? He asked as he rushed over to her with his head still bleeding. It's a long story. Very long, Mary said. Here, here, sit here. Let me clean that up. Mary added. She sat him down, had his hair now hardened with the blood. With the cut he suffered from the beating Jacob gave him, she cleaned the cut as best she could, 
and then washed his hair. They were both now in the same boat, trapped in a turret of the Lord family mansion, hiding from their past. Hers much more twisted than his, but they were both locked away. I wish you could tell me where you've been, he said, as sh she helped him remove his shirt and she could wash out the blood. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, she said, grinning. Besides, what's the point anymore? I've lost it all, she added. I think I wouldn't believe it. I've seen what you and your mother could do, and it's not like we have anything else to do, he answered. Philip was right. He knew what she was. He was there and on the night Eliza turned Sebastian into what he was in fact she was a lot the one who took his blood to use revive sebastian they should have no secrets from each other but mary still weak from the helping eliza escape brains didn't want to get into her transformation who knew we'd end up here together all these years and all the terrible things we've seen and now it's just like just the two of us here and hiding like two ghosts haunting an attic. They've really done a number on us, haven't they? Mary said, referring to the Lords. I wish I could change. I wish I could go back and change it all, Philip said, as Mary washed his shirt in a small porcelain sink near the tiny turret window. We can't change the things we hate from our lives, much like we can't change the thing we love. We, all, we can only move forward, Mary said. How can we? The family seems to be to cross us at every part. Look at Celeste. Jacob has her now in a way I only wished I didn't know how I could get her back, Philip said. They sent us on a path to nowhere, haven't they, Philip? Mary said, sitting next to him on the bed. She looked in his eyes, his tired, pained eyes, and looked into her. He looked into hers. There reflected a blue shine of beautiful. They seemed to be just as hurt as he was. They were both broken hearts with their worlds and turmoil trapped together. He turned, he leaned down, lowering his head so that her nose met, met and kissed her softly. She leaned back in surprise, and then she kissed him. Their two broken hearts healing together in the turret room, finding peace in the silence of the solitude they shared. No one was coming for them. No one cared where they were. They even believed it, it was the end of for them, that no matter what they did, as the night soon came, they'd be left to die there in a small stone-walled room. Is there... Is there Nothing else, Philip whispered to her as she felt every inch of his chest. The rain fell. The storm rolled across the sky, continued th throughout the evening. There's always more, She's w she whispered back, and now that it's just you and me, perhaps we can be friends, or maybe fate had brought us together here to be more than that. His eyes so warm, so deep and brown, twinkled in her gaze. He felt needed. Maybe he could help her find her way out of this. Maybe he could save them both somehow. Philip smirked boyishly at her, which made her giggle. Even though his heart was broken, her showed a happy face. It was something. She needed to see, too. He paused, then slowly kissed Mary again. Her soft, long blonde hair finding its way tangled up in his fingers. Then Philip laid her back and slowly unbuttoned her top as it her, their skin touched. In the flickering light of the candles and oil lamps all around the small 500 square foot terror room, Philip and Mary found a silver lining in their capacity in each other's eyes, in each other's kiss as the rain came down and they made love. In the setting sun, a little house in a quiet, lush neighborhood saw a car shining and glittering with tiny drips of rain reflecting the shy 
or sorry, the sky above, pull up into the mud in front of the tiny wooden porch. The certain, or sorry, the curtain of the front window shift to the left as a hand pulled the back the fabric to see the car. Hampstead opened the door to a soaked car and helped Rebecca out and over the large murky puddle, holding her left hand up as her right hand lifted the front hem of her long dress inside the house was Caspian, a man new to Welshport Village. That Rebecca met the night Jacob was brought to the hospital after being shot because he's the one who shot him. He said to of himself of being wise, his face sun scorched and tan with dark hair and dark brown eyes. The wrinkles around his face seemed to frame a, wo a woman who smiled often, but his wrinkles were smirks of from the sun. Caspian opened the front door to his small cottage before Rebecca could knock. Well, you finally came, he said, standing front and center in his door with a dark cloak around his shoulders. You told me that night we met you could guide me. I have to know things. I have to know the truth about what really happened in my household. Rebecca said as the cold rain wind blew across her face. Come, Caspian said, standing out aside so Rebecca could enter. Not him, he said, pointing to Hampstead. Rebecca had Hampstead sit and wait in the car. As she entered, Caspian led Rebecca to a small room, a parlor of sorts that had been decorated with large tapestries framed on the wall. The curtains of the room had been drawn and only three giant candles circled. Circular and cream colored wax were lighting the room. In the center of the room, a round table with four chairs draped in black. Rebecca noticed the black tablecloth was freshly clean and embroidered with small white stars all along the edges. On the wall behind her was an iron letter, H with the irony ivy leaves growing around it through its acres. Rebecca sat down across from Caspian who smiled at his new client innocently. He extended his hands to Rebecca and held them tight. What is it you seek, Miss Lord? asked he as he poured her a glass of wine. The truth, she answered, taking the glass but never sipping a drop. My family is in constant turmoil. Darkness, lies, and secrets are common. Now two members of my household are gone, missing. I don't know whether or not to believe what I've been told about their vanishing, but in truth I have no idea what to believe about anything Rebecca confessed. I see, Caspian replied. I can help you. I will help you. There are things in this realm that are hard to explain, but I will do my best. I've dealt with the other side before. I have no fear of it. Trust me, Rebecca said. Have you? Caspian smiled. How interesting. How have you dealt with the other side? The side will all go do after we leave this life. I once had a man who lived in my house. He was a sort of a spiritual guide <coughs> that unfortunately met a terrible fate. I wish I could have helped him before his death, but alas, he succumbed to his injuries, Rebecca said at, of Gaspar Dupree's, the con artist Jacob hired to convince Rebecca her superstitions were really only for Sebastian to come along and take him as his first victim. And my late husband has visited me, I think. I think it was him, Shadow. Interesting, Caspian replied. Here, take these, he added, handing Rebecca beads from a small pouch he had around her waist. What are they? They will protect you, Caspian answered. 
protect me from what? He stared at her. She felt it, the heat of his stare, the intensity of his eyes. They seemed to glow like a flame, like a red-hot flame. Then he smiled as if he had heard a joke. He found her constant questions amusing, as if she were the only one in control, but he knew otherwise. Miss Lord, Caspian paused and licked his lips. I don't know what others, what your other spiritual guide did for you, but when I do my work, I truly enter the other world. And for me to enter the other world, to seek the truth, I need to let some of those spirits enter me. These beings will protect you from any of those souls to enter you. I wouldn't want that, would you? Caspian explained. Rebecca gulped and shook her head no, then squeezed the beads tightly in her head. Stay quiet. I will have the souls and the spirits of the sinister of Highgrove of my house to reach me, Caspian instructed as he closed his eyes. Breath of frost, cold, cold and lost. Come into my heart and sing. Surround me with a ring of light and sound. Never go out of bound with my words and my soul. Let me be the vessel, the center of the world. Enter me and tell me so. What is it that takes Rebecca's glow? As Rebecca's heart pounded and the storm began to churn above the small house in the village where Caspian lived, the tablecloth began to sway in the cold breeze that came from nowhere. Caspian's face suddenly changed. It became ashen and cold, hard even like white marble. He began to shake in his chair and his grasp on Rebecca's free hand tightened. Then it, in a shocking burn, Caspian opened his mouth and blood began to pour. Rebecca screamed and let go of his hand. She grabbed onto his, to the beads and screamed as Caspian blood poured all over the table, cloth and oozing down, turning to tiny white stars on the trim blood red. Caspian, in his trance, opened his eyes. They were white and glowing. Then his teeth, the two canines in his mouth, became sharp and pointed, and the man hissed at Rebecca, cold and evil. Then suddenly the thunder clapped and Caspian passed out on the table. Seen seconds passed and he came to, his mouth and face stained with blood, his eyes back to normal, his teeth now safe in their neutral shape, natural shape. What did you see? Tell me, what did you see of those two women? Evie and Georgina, where are they? What has happened to them? Rebecca asked of her new fortune teller, knowing full well that Caspian's shape-shifting resembled was that of the creature her own grandson had turned into. Caspian pretended to be terrified of what he saw. He wasn't. Nothing scared him. He, most, he was mostly intrigued of the power of the creature, the, the spirits of his house, the coven of the sisters of Hivegrove had shown him through the, his supernatural shape-shifting, the vampire Sebastian. He could still taste the blood of it, and he found himself feeling a bit competitive, knowing he was not the only shadow creature hunting the rocky shores of Welshwood. Well, Rebecca shouted, what did you see? Tell me, Caspian, once again pretending to be in fear and worried for Rebecca's loved ones. When he surely was not, no, only replied in one honest word, and what he saw in his vision, he said, Death. Alright guys, that is the read-along. Really, really good. Really, really straight ten. I like the fact that, so, Sebastian isn't dead. The spell that um, Eliza put him under to bring him back. Uh, the sun can only kill him. So all the myths of vampire. I like how John here isn't making Sebastian just some normal vampire. That's really neat. And I do believe this is covered 
when Sebastian changes to, if memory serves me. Um, also, I'm, I wonder if the woman, um, Alice warned Philip about what was Mary. <laughs> just, just wonder. <laughs> just wonder. Um, you wouldn't think it would be. I mean, I could be wrong. Um, that's scary if it is. <laughs> Don't don't betray them blonde haired women. Barnabas can tell you this from experience. <laughs> um Caspian is a sinister, sinister dude. I think I think Jacob's got it got some competition. Um <laughs> shit. Uh, but um I, I was Hampstead seems to be really torn between his boss's sanity and and fearing for her. I think Hamstead is somewhat in love with Rebecca. I could be wrong. So do not do not take my predictions too, too seriously. I um, hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. Link is obviously going to be in the description box. You guys have a great night. Bye-bye.